Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Ken. This is Kenny, and um, today uh, the talk is on types of intellectual property and enforcement procedures. Uh, before we start, I, I see the number of participants are still coming in slowly. Uh, perhaps it's a Friday, and uh, some of my some of our our friends may, may still be in prayers and whatnot. So I will just uh, perhaps uh, start a little bit later, uh, perhaps a few minutes later before we start the session uh, to give more time for more participants to join in. Uh, thank you. Okay, everyone, I think uh, we have reached the uh, sufficient numbers to begin. So without further ado, uh, let's begin with today's session. Uh, just give me a short moment to pull up the uh, slides. Okay. Okay. So I hope everyone can hear me loud and clear. Um, so before I begin, just a few housekeeping uh, matters. Um, I, I prefer a live and uh, interactive session with everyone. So if there's any question uh, or uh, queries in respect of uh, my presentation, uh, please feel free to, to drop 
questions or a text in the text box and I'll respond uh, at the appropriate time, either through this, throughout the course of my talk or at the end of the session today. Okay. Okay, so today the talk is on types of intellectual property rights and enforcement procedures. Um, just a brief note, this is going to be a very broad based uh, subject matter because intellectual property rights, uh, though broad, they cover a lot of issues in law and have real life consequences. So it is close to impossible to, close, to cover every single issue and topic under intellectual property rights under an hour and 15 minutes. So this is going to be a very broad based approach to deal with the subject matter. And I think I'll spend a little bit more time to talk about the enforcement procedures uh, in, the, in respect of uh, protecting each type of uh, intellectual property rights. And, uh, and that is often I, I find an area that has not been explored or developed enough in the context of uh, Malaysian law. Uh, with that in mind, I'll just proceed with the first topic. Okay. This is the title. Okay. Before we proceed to the each type of intellectual property, let's have a very broad based understanding of what intellectual property is. Now, intellectual property uh, is a type of, is a niche area of law that grants rights to owners to control the use of its IP in a particular territory or country. So the very first idea that I want to introduce to everyone is IP rights are territorial in nature. What it means is if you have a particular IP right, for example, a registration of a particular brand or trademark in Malaysia, it doesn't necessarily entitle you to protection in other jurisdictions in which you do not have a trademark registration in. Uh, this is because uh, by its very nature, IPs are territorial in nature, and it has a lot to do with the particular background, culture, and temperament of each population in each respective country. Uh, I give you an example. For example, uh, there, were, there was a very heated uh, controversy in respect of uh, an alcohol by the brand of Tima lately. Now, an alcohol with the brand of Tima, uh, though whether it should cause controversy in this country or not remains to be debated, but the fact is it is a controversial brand in Malaysia. It does not necessarily attract the same level of uh, controversy in neighboring countries, for example, in Singapore or in the Western jurisdictions such as UK, Australia, and whatnot. The reason is because Tima, rightly or wrongly, carries a certain level of cultural connotation in Malaysia, but it may not carry the same consequence in other jurisdictions. Therefore, whether Tima can be registered as a legal trademark in Malaysia, uh, the same question of legality may not arise in other jurisdictions, uh, purely because of policy reasons, uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned. So that example shows us that rightly, IP is a very territorial type of law, and each and every country has its own IP laws to protect them. So that is the first idea I want to introduce everyone. So why do we need IP? IP provides a reward system for creativity and innovation. For example, if an inventor has spent all his life or the best case in scenario, let's say Thomas Edison or uh, uh, Nikola Tesla has spent all their life to provide and create inventions for the betterment of uh, the mankind it will be grossly unfair to them if their ideas and inventions are not protected by IP laws and any Tom, Dick and Harry can just write off their efforts and their goodwill uh, to make money, you know. So without proper IP system in place, nobody would be incentivized to create new things. Nobody would be incentivized to innovate and to create more things for the betterment of mankind. Okay, that is another major role of IP. Okay, 
And because it is a, a reward system and, and it is a very valuable thing to, to protect a particular uh, IP and or efforts of work, IP has now evolved into an asset that can be bought or sold, just like your uh, real estate properties, your shares, because what IP represents are not something that is tangible. It is a type of intangible asset that represents uh, a person's uh, efforts, hard work, and uh, creativity in the creation of each particular IP. So it is also a type asset that can be bought and then can be sold okay so generally that is what ip is it is in its name it is a type of property but it is intellectual in nature okay now generally these are the five most common types of uh, ip right uh, there are more uh, subversions or, or, or subsets of uh, copyrights for example there are utility innovations under the heading of patent, uh, but that is a very specific type of IP rights, which I think I will not have time to cover it today. So I will just choose the five most common types of IP that we can see in our everyday lives, and we'll cover them. They are trademarks, copyright, patent, industrial design, and confidential information. Okay. Now, Trademarks. I have chosen the three most visible and common trademarks that we can see in our everyday lives, at McDonald's, Starbucks, and Huawei. Now, as everyone is aware, once you look at these logos, you recognize straight away what business it represents and what goods and services it provides. Okay, because the main function of trademarks is to uh, allow the public to identify what kind of goods and services that each business provides. It is the identity of each business, be uh, is the provision of goods or the provision of services. It provides a utility to the public and a function to the public. And this is a, a very essential uh, element in commerce, you know? so. A lot has been said uh, whether logos and trademarks, brands and whatnot requires a uh, registration or not. Now there's one school of thought that says it requires registration uh, if you want the most uh, uncontroversial form of uh, protection, which is trademark registration under the Trademarks Act 2019, in which you would submit a form, you'll fill out the particulars of your trademark and your brands, which class of goods and services that your trademark intends to cover, you submit to the trademark office. In Malaysia, it's known as my IPO. And once the formalities have been processed and uh, the trademark is registered in accordance with law, because mind you, uh, there are certain requirements in law that each trademark has to uh, fulfill before uh, it can be registered as a trademark. Uh, just a few key examples. Uh, it must be uh, distinctive and it cannot be contrary to public policy, similar to uh, the, the example of Tima that I've raised uh, uh, previously. Whether it is a uh, correct or apt uh, example to be cited in this situation, I think uh, that is a separate topic to be discussed, but <clears throat> it is a requirement in law that trademarks cannot offend public policy. Okay, you cannot you can you cannot have pornographic materials as your trademarks, for example. Okay, that just simply can't be allowed in this country. All right. So <clears throat> once registration is obtained under the provisions of the Trademarks Act, uh, it, it becomes automatic uh, prima facie evidence of ownership of the applicants in respect of the, the trademark. So say that I have registered trademark A uh, in in Today's day is 29th of October, 2021. I will become the prefa facie owner for the next five years of that particular trademark that I have registered uh, because uh, each term of uh, registration of trademark lasts for five years and is subject to renewal for every five years. And this protection can be permanent and can, it can be perpetual 
so long as you keep on renewing your trademark registration. Now, what happens if a trademark is not registered? Uh, is it still uh, entitled to protection in law? This is a common question that keeps up, keeps up uh, cropping up because uh, back in the 1970s and 80s, a lot of businesses have cropped up. But uh, at that time, infrastructure was not uh, very complete and, and education was not uh, free flowing at that point in time. Uh, registration of trademarks are not common at that point in time. So what happens is uh, a lot of businesses just went on, they carry on their trademarks without registering it. And then come by the 1990s and 2000s, where uh, information are more freely available and the infrastructure for trademark registration is set up, you start seeing cases of infringement, you know, and, and people are challenging uh, trademarks on the basis that, uh, you know, your trademark is not registered and therefore it's not entitled to protection. Uh, this is not correct because uh, under the common law, thought of passing off, one are still entitled to protection under the law in respect of its uh, logo or brand or trademark, simply because the business has acquired goodwill uh, over the years uh, in respect of its uh, trademark. Therefore, it would be uh, amounting to a theft or, or, or appropriation of one's uh, goodwill uh, for if you copy a person's unregistered trademark, okay? So the requirement here is what, even if you don't register the trademark, you must establish that your brand, your logo, your trademark has enjoyed goodwill and reputation in the country over the years. That must, you must be able to provide evidence to show that the public has recognized your uh, trademark with you, you know? So that being the case, uh, it is incorrect to say that unregistered trademarks are, are not entitled to protection under the law. It is equally as protected under the law. The only challenge there is you need to provide evidence to prove goodwill and reputation, okay? So that is uh, the, the broad uh, analysis of trademarks. Now for copyright, uh, it is a type of uh, IP that specifically protects literary, musical, and artworks, okay? So here I cited three examples. Here, this is a drawing of Mona Lisa. Here, it is the uh, cover of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And this is the cover of uh, a video game known as Final Fantasy VII the Remake. Now, for copyright, uh, the protection is very, very uh, broad and uh, it, that the types of work that it protects uh, covers a lot of facets of our life, okay? Uh, for example, uh, in respect of the example of Harry Potter itself, not only the artwork of the cover is protected, the content and of the literature of the Harry Potter book is also protected as well. And insofar as Final Fantasy VII is concerned, yes, the artwork of the cover is protected, but the uh, internal drawings, uh, the graphical uh, expressions of the game itself is also subject to protection. So I would argue that copyright is a very broad based uh, IP law that extends to a lot of production of works, you know, because copyright doesn't protect, you always hear this uh, around when somebody talks of copyright. Copyright laws doesn't protect ideas, it protects the reproduction or the production of the idea itself. So, so long as whatever contents that you have in your, in your head in respect of a particular literature or a book, it will not be protected unless you reduce it into writing, okay? So, so long as something is expressed and reduced into a material form, generally it would attract some level of copyright protection, okay? So the governing law in Malaysia is the Copyrights Act uh, 1987. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's not subjected to uh, any amendments so far. And the most interesting feature about the statute that is 
uh, a little bit different from other jurisdiction is the duration of uh, the protection of uh, copyrighted materials. Now, how copyright law works is this. Generally, the rights to copyright will first be divested with the author itself, himself. Okay, it is then you move on to see in what context has that work been produced? Has the work been produced in the context of an employer employee relationship? So, for example, if uh, I'm a lawyer today, I drafted a piece of article on my own and have submitted to the firm for publication. Now, the copyright of the article that I have produced, though I am the owner, because I produce it in the context of employer-employee relationship, the copyright of the article would be divested with the firm. Now, what that, what that means is, it is the firm itself that can take action if there is any reproduction of uh, my work by any other party, okay? And if there's any proceeds that is derived from any work that I've done for the firm, the firm will derive uh, the profits for itself because the copyright of my work as an employee to my employer, the firm, resides with the firm. Now, this applies to across to all industries, to researchers, uh, to marketeers, to uh, art in-house studio artists and whatnot. It all belongs to the employer, okay? Another situation is when you have employed somebody to do a particular piece of work for you, for example, you've hired an architect uh, to render a drawing of a house for you. Although the author of the drawing is the architect, but the copyright of the drawing that the architect has done for you belongs to you. Okay, The architect can't go around and say, hey, somebody else has copied my work, I need to sue. No. The copyright of the drawing resides in you as the owner of the copyright of the drawing because you have paid for the copyright of the drawing by hiring uh, that builders will draw for you. So this is how uh, copyright works in Malaysia. Now, the most interesting feature about Malaysian copyright law is this. The duration of the copyright would last for 50 years. And on top, oh, sorry, for, 20, for 50 years. And on top of it, 20 years after the author has deceased. So that is a very interesting feature because uh, in most jurisdictions, the copyright would just simply die off when the authors uh, get deceased. But in Malaysia, it will still carry on for some number of years after the author has deceased. So that is an interesting feature in so far as Malaysian copyright law is concerned. Right? So I have covered trademark so far, I've covered uh, copyright. Now, patent, it is very interesting and it is the, some of the most, would argue, some of the most uh, complex type of uh, IP because trademark protects brands and logos, copyrights protects reproduction of works, and patent protects inventions. Now, how do you make a distinction between a copyright and a patent then? Aren't they protecting the same thing? Uh, no. Because patent, unlike copyright, it protects the invention itself. It protects the steps to create the inventions itself. Okay, so this is very, very close to the protection of ideas, right? Because in so far as patents is concerned, once you have the steps to invent something, it is new. It, is, uh, it has an inventive step where nobody has anticipated it before and it has industrial application, okay? It is entitled to patent protection. Now, under the Patents Act 1983, there are a few types of invention that is not uh, patentable. The term not patentable means it cannot be entitled to patent protection. Uh, the first is uh, mathematical methods. So if you have stumbled upon, upon a type of mathematical formula, algorithm and whatnot, uh, it is not uh, entitled to patent protection. So this is bad news for mathematicians all around the world. Method of treatment is also another type of example that cannot be 
patented. Now, this is different from formulation of drugs huh? because formulation of drug itself is the creation of drugs. It is not a method of treatment. Method of treatment refers to ways that you treat someone. For example, the way you inject a particular type of liquid into the body, the way you administer a dose, uh, whether you want to have a high dose or low dose, high interval or low interval of particular drug into a person's body, that is also method of treatment. So uh, remember, there's a clear distinction to be made between manufacture of drugs and method of treatments. The manufacture of drugs, the steps to manufacture the drug itself uh, is entitled to patent protection, but the method to administer the drugs that are manufactured are not entitled to patent protection. So that is another very common type of uh, invention that is not patentable. Uh, discovery of uh, plant types is also not uh, patentable. So say one day you explore Gunung Ledang and then you have stumbled upon a species that has uh, of, of a plant that has never been seen before by the world. That discovery itself is not entitled to patent protection. However, if you have discovered upon that new plant species, you have taken it, take it to a lab for further research, reverse engineering, and you create something new, a new type of plant from there. And that is uh, patentable because there's human intervention and human efforts into something that is natural, all right? So that human uh, effort and human intervention in uh, modification of plants is what that is entitled to be patented. So there are a lot of uh, variables when it comes to whether an invention is patentable or not. More often than not, if the discovery involves something that has uh, something natural in origins, prima facie, it is not patentable unless you can show that there's some level or some degree of human intervention involved in, in the discovery itself, okay? So patent, because it is a very uh, complex type of IP law that protects invention and invention itself is a very is a very uh, complex and intangible matter. How you define an invention? You need to know it's new. You need to know it's uh, involves an inventive step. But how do you answer these questions? How do you know an invention is novel? How do you know an invention uh, actually involved an inventive step? So this is why to register a patent, generally, especially for global uh, patent protection uh, registration, it will require between five to six years before uh, a, a particular registration for a patent uh, can be successfully completed. Why? Uh, to answer the question whether it is novel, first you need to identify what is what we call the relevant art. For example, if you're talking about uh, the creation of new drugs, the relevant art would be the art of pharmaceuticals, okay? Because it deals with the manufacture of drugs. So once you identify the art, you need to identify the person's skill in the art, uh, or in, in, in our terms, it, it basically means a relevant expert. You need to look through all the literatures, publications, talks, any source of information uh, that may be relevant with the invention and check and see whether something similar has been mentioned before or not. So if in a talk, somebody has proposed the idea of uh, create a type of drug that has compound ABC and, and later on somebody else go and create a drug with compound ABC, that person is not entitled to a patent protection simply because that compound of ABC has been disclosed before and therefore it fails the novelty test. Uh, so all around the world, you have uh, patent officers uh, with the necessary experts in their hire and with all the literature uh, scientific in, in all the fields that they have to check and see whenever a patent application comes in, 
the relevant officers will go through it and check and see whether it is novel and whether it involves an inventive step. Of course, uh, this process is also subject to a lot of disputes because what, what one may think to be not novel and not inventive is always uh, not agreed by the inventor himself. That's why patent registration can even take even longer if there are disputes arising between the findings of the patent office and the applicant who is the inventor himself. Okay, so okay, I see some questions coming in. Uh, perhaps I, I, okay, so this one deals with uh, copyright and this one deals with patent. So uh, two different areas of law, perhaps I will take it at the end of the talk, yeah, uh, if you don't mind, okay. So, uh, so yeah, patent, uh, generally that is what it's about. Uh, patent prosecution is another big topic to be discussed, which, which I can't uh, conclude and, and I can't package in this talk under one hour. But one, one fine day, I think that I have a talk a little on in the Malaysian bar where I will talk about uh, patent management and uh, patent prosecution. So stay tuned for that talk uh, if you're interested in patent prosecution, yeah? So there's a, there's a whole other level of uh, considerations in that area, okay? Generally, I've done with patent. Uh, industrial design is another interesting type of IP. So, uh, so far, we have covered logos. We have covered uh, reproduction of uh, artistic, literal, and musical work. We have also covered inventions. Now we talk about... Uh, industrial design, uh, which are the outlines of uh, the product itself. Specifically, it protects features of shape, configuration, pa pattern, ornament applied to an item, which are features appeal and judged by the eye. Usually, it's confined to outlooks and aesthetics. And in Malaysia, it is governed by the Industrial Designs Act 1996. Now, one may ask, what is the uh, difference between uh, copyright and industrial design. So in Malaysia, we have adopted a mechanism where if something can be uh, properly registered as industrial design, it is not entitled to copyright uh, protection. Uh, this is to avoid a uh, double level of protection. And uh, it also would make administration of uh, IP laws much easier uh, in Malaysia. So if the type of work that you're trying to register falls under the meaning of uh, industrial design in Malaysia, which is features of shape, configuration, pattern, or ornament applied to an item, which are features appear and judged by the eye, which, which are usually aesthetics and, and, and the outlook and shape and outline of the product itself, it would fall under the definition of industrial design under the Industrial Designs Act 1996, and therefore it will not be entitled to copyright protection. Okay, so industrial design is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, the registration system is also fairly straightforward. All you need to do is to submit the, the, the pictures of, of your industrial design from various angles. Uh, state who the author is, and there's an important requirement of novelty uh, in respect of industrial designs uh, before it can be registered. So it will go through the same process again. Uh, the office, my IPO will check in its database whether there's something similar that has been registered before, conduct the necessary search uh, in other sources, and if it's indeed new, uh, it would be entitled to industrial design protection. Okay, uh, very straightforward. Now here comes confidential information or know-how, trade secrets and know-how. Now this is uh, also a very broad based uh, type of IP uh, simply because uh, it is very, very intangible. You wouldn't uh, be able to identify and, you, and most of the time people don't classify confidential information unless uh, litigation arise. Now, in Malaysia, there is no statute that governs confidential information, trade secrets, and know-how in Malaysia. Uh, it is derived from common law principles, okay? Meaning it is derived from commonwealth cases where judges have made uh, laws 
and principles to protect uh, confidential information. So some real life examples, yeah. Uh, sensitive information that are disclosed between uh, employers and employees, business partners, and these will include business plans, marketing strategies, customers' database, undisclosed development works, um, your appraisal forms, uh, any correspondence that are shared in confidence uh, in the company. Uh, so if you think about it, confidential information is actually very, very uh, far ranging, you know? So most of the time when we have confidential information, breach of confidence cases in court, the first question the court will ask is whether the information that you seek to protect is confidential information in the first place. So in the case of worldwide rota dies in Europe heart against Ronald Ong Chiu Chiu, the court has formulated the test of, of determining what is confidential information. So in determining whether such information can be regarded as confidential, it has been held that what makes it confidential is the fact that the maker of the document had used his brain and thus produce a result which, which can only be produced by somebody who goes through the same process. Now, this may not sound much, but this has introduced a very, very important concept uh, in confidential information. Uh, it, it, it places emphasis on the origins of the information. So if the origin of the information came from somebody, okay, you can't hijack the process of that person has gone through to come up with the information, okay? So this is the whole jurisprudence of confidential information. It is confidential because someone has made the effort to create that piece of information for a particular purpose. If you hijack that person's process and use that information for other purposes that is suited to your own end, and that's where breach of confidence uh, uh, comes in because you have hijacked somebody else's efforts uh, to forward your own gain. So this is the whole jurisprudence of confidential information, okay? So of course, there are a lot of arguments to defeat uh, confidential information. Uh, for example, one very popular uh, counter argument is, oh friend, it is the information that you seek to protect is already in the public domain. Uh, so it cannot be confidential because everybody knows it. Okay, that's a very common uh, argument. Uh, another argument is also, uh, yes, I mean, I mean, I have obtained the information, but it's not confidential information in nature because uh, in my agreement, there's nothing stopping me to use the information for other purposes, for example. You know, so these are some of the most common types of uh, arguments. But it, it is very, very important to understand that so long as the information that are conveyed to you are conveyed to, are conveyed to you in confidence and requires you to maintain certain level of confidentiality of the information that you have obtained, generally it is confidential. And even if you have left the employment of the company, you cannot use the information to your own gain. There are a plethora of cases on this, uh, which I can't cover today because this is a broad-based subject. And uh, I believe I have uh, written an, an alert on this previously and, and uh, I will share with everyone upon request, okay? I see another question coming in. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll take it at the end of the talk, yeah, if you don't mind. Okay. So uh, generally, that is, uh, these are the five types of most common type of IP rights out there. And in a very broad fashion, uh, I try to cover as many interesting features of each uh, intellectual property right as possible. Uh, but I think it is more after you identify what the what intellectual properties are, it is also very important to know how to protect them. You know, so this is how enforcement comes in. Now, very broadly speaking, I have uh, listed uh, five enforcement options. Well, legal remedies are not strictly enfor enforcement options. 
But these, the legal remedies are something that you can put in the mind of the infringer in the event of an infringement. You know, so in a way, it acts as a deterrent. That's why I listed under uh, enforcement options because once we have done with, uh, once we have dealt with the letter of cease and desist, uh, liaising with enforcement agencies, liaising with ISP. ISP here means Internet Service Provider. Uh, that is, a, I think, some of the lesser explored uh, options for enforcement, which I will cover. Uh, ex parte injunctions and anthem pillar orders. Uh, this is also a, a legal option to immediately uh, control the damage of infringement, if any. And at the end, if you are successful in your action for an IP infringement, you're looking at getting damages on, on the basis of account of profits, deliver up and permanent injunctions. All these are, are designed to protect your IP rights uh, on the long term. Okay, so these are the, uh, this list of enforcement is of course not uh, exhaustive. Uh, each facts and case are different. So, uh, different enforcement options may arise uh, according to the type of situation that you're in. But generally, uh, these four types of enforcement options are what comes, are what that are first come to mind to IP practitioners. Okay, so let's look at each enforcement option in detail. Now, cease and desist letters. To those who are familiar with cease and desist letters, uh, you'll be familiar with the contents of the letter, yeah? So the letters, uh, most cease and desist letters would contain these few things. It would state the background facts uh, leading to uh, what exactly has been infringed, be it on your copy of my mark, you have copied my work, you infringed my patent or whatnot, all right? You, you say all those things. And then uh, at the end, you demand something, all right? And generally, the first thing you ask the person is to stop. That's why it's called a letter to cease and desist. Basically, it's a letter asking, of asking the infringer to stop. Failing which, you take legal actions. So uh, this is the general structure of uh, cease and desist letters. But before we issue cease and desist letters, it's very important to understand that its objective is to put an immediate stop. And it is not uh, necessarily the best option that you can uh, exercise at every situation. You have to look at the level of damage done, if any, uh, in, in the infringement that you're facing with. So say that uh, the infringement that you're dealing with, uh, uh, this is a person who has uh, copied your mark for the first time, for example, uh, and, and this is as a small timer and this is the first time he has done it more chances than not uh, on the chance of probabilities the person may stop if uh, you send a cease and desist letter because the business is new he may want stability he doesn't want much trouble so in this kind of situations uh, cease and desist letters are very very effective in our in our experience but if you're dealing with repeated uh, offenders of uh, infringers who would keep on switching identities, changing identities uh, to avoid uh, enforcement and avoid action to be taken against them. Then cease and desist letter may be just uh, a piece of paper that serves no purpose and can't achieve any objective at all. Okay, so that's why I say at the end here, it is ineffective against uh, contumacious offenders. Contumacious means uh, willfully uh, st and stubbornly refuse to obey. Okay, so I think when you look at cease and desist letters, you have to ask yourself whether you achieve the objective that is designed to do. So the first question is whether the uh, offender is a repeated offender. Uh, if it's a repeated offender, you do not want to lose your element of surprise. And uh, if the level of damage is very, very low, sometimes it can just be resolved with a simple WhatsApp or a simple phone call you know, to, to the relevant business because, especially for new businesses. So, uh, and, and, and uh, cease and desist letters is very commonly issued by lawyers, but I think uh, sometimes, uh, you know, to preserve the element of surprise, there is no necessity to send cease and desist letters. In, in my opinion, that, that is my approach. 
Okay. So I've, see, I've seen now uh, another query. Okay, I think the queries are coming in. Perhaps I'll just deal with uh, everyone at the end of the session, okay? No. Uh, liaising with uh, enforcement agencies. Uh, before the pandemic days, uh, where physical movement are much more uh, free-flowing, the, the enforcement division of the Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs are very, very busy because usually they are the first port of call uh, when there's any, uh, for example, counterfeits in the market or there's any goods or services that are infringing uh, existing or uh, registered trademarks. So what you would do is uh, you would conduct together with the officers in charge uh, to do a trap purchase or do raids uh, at the premises with the uh, infringing goods. Okay, trap purchase is a very interesting experience because what you do is uh, sometimes uh, clients will hire lawyers or hire uh, some uh, freelancer to uh, mask themselves as uh, purchasers. So they will go to the store, to the store, the shop as an innocent purchaser. They purchase it, they get the receipt and the trap purchase is concluded because that becomes evidence in court of infringement. And before Trademarks Act 2019 came into force, uh, the Trade Descriptions Act uh, requires uh, parties uh, or the applicants or the complainants uh, to perform or all these trap purchases and, and to get the evidence and get what we call a trade description order where the description is said to be misleading and fake because it infringes your mark or whatsoever. And that becomes uh, conclusive evidence of uh, trademark infringement, which you can enforce in court. Uh, but now comes Trademarks Act 2019, where in the cases of very similar marks, uh, you don't have to go to court uh, with a trade description or to ask for a trade description order anymore. Uh, and you're going to do trap purchases and rates and whatnot. You can just seek for a verification with the trademark registrar under section 112 of the Trademarks Act 2019. And if you can get the verification from the trademark registrar and he agrees with you that there is confusion or there is infringement of the trademark, this becomes prima facie evidence that you can go to court. So instead of going to court twice, you'll only go to court once with this verification uh, from the trademark registrar. Now, that being said, uh, I would argue that uh, trap tra purchases and rates uh, have not seen the end of its days because uh, trap purchase is a very useful way to gather evidence uh, because mind you, verification, even though you can get a verification from the trademark registrar and it does have uh, evidential value because it is prima facie evidence. I will argue that best evidence is always uh, documentary evidence or in this case, physical evidence itself, which has more probative value in court. So I would argue that trade purchase has not seen the end of its days. And of course, rates have not seen at, uh, the end of, it, of its days. With MCO uh, being lifted now and a business activity gets back to normal. Uh, rates are a very effective option. And it's a very realistic option, to be honest, to stop the source uh, of infringing goods being flowed into the market. So even though uh, we have this verification measure under the new Trademarks Act, I will argue that trap purchases and rates are still equally relevant as enforcement options for uh, trademark owners. Okay. Uh, Liaising with internet service providers. Uh, this is very, very uh, specific and confined to online infringements only. Uh, for online infringements, of course, uh, if you're talking about infringements uh, in respect of the sale of uh, counterfeit goods online, as most of the commerce now happens online through uh, mark big marketplace platforms such as Lazada and such as Shopee. Uh, for Lazada and Shopee, they have existing uh, mechanisms where you can actually lodge a complaint with them at the appropriate links and website to say that of oh, these particular goods that is marketed on your platform infringes my goods, infringes my trademark, these are the evidence, please take it down. 
usually they'll respond and they will conduct their own fact finding exercise. If they agree with you, they will take it down. So for uh, online marketplaces, uh, those are the existing mechanisms, but what if the infringement is beyond uh, online marketplaces? What do you do? So uh, in this kind of situation, you go back to the actual body or actual entity that, with con that has control over the display of this information online, which are internet service providers. So just to give a few examples in Malaysia, our most uh, common internet service providers, there are Tele Telecom Malaysia, there's Unify, there's Streamix, there is uh, Time, you know, DG is also an internet service provider. So uh, basically internet service providers, in a nutshell, they provide access to the internet and they also control uh, what content uh, is to be displayed and whatnot because they host the process that allows the materials to go online, okay? So uh, in so far as uh, trademark, patent and industrial design is concerned, there is no uh, express rules uh, or, or laws that impose a certain type of liability onto the internet service providers to do something in the event of an infringement online, uh, save and accept for the Copyrights Act 1983. Now this is uh, an amendment that has, has come on quite some time, but uh, interestingly, there's not many reported cases on this. So I've reproduced the entire section itself, the relevant section uh, in respect of uh, notification by copyright owner and its effect. Okay, uh, I, I would encourage everyone to get a copy and read uh, fully on your own. But if I may summarize, it basically means if I'm a copyright owner, I have a piece of work that is published outside and I notice someone has been uh, distributing it online through various platforms in an illegal manner, set up their own website, set up their own blogs to talk about my uh, copyrighted material and distributes my copyrighted material, I have the right to notify the internet service provider and say, hey, I realized at this point in time, at this date, at this website, this person is infringing my copyright. You know, he's distributing my work and whatsoever. So please take it down. And in so doing, I agree to give you an, an indemnity. Because if I'm the internet service provider, I'll be afraid, okay, if I take it down, would I cause any loss to the, this other person who, who hosts a blog or the website or whatnot? You know, so the internet service provider has to be protected. That's why together with the notification, there must be an undertaking to compensate. So once the internet service provider receives the notification and the undertaking, the ISP will, is obliged in law to remove or disable any access to the infringing electronic copy on his network not later than 48 hours from the time the notification was received. Now, this is a statutory timeline which all the ISPs have to follow. And I would argue that the fact that you don't see many cases on, on this particular section and in this particular uh, and this option means this, this section is not subjected to so much controversy and perhaps it has been in practice in a very, very uh, effective way in practice, uh, not that I'm aware of, but I think this is a very good piece of legislation for enforcement. So what happens after it has been taken down, all right? Of course, the person who, who was affected is entitled to issue a counter notification to the service provider. And of course, gift undertaking at the same time and say, hey, I didn't, infringe this person's copyright, please restore access, all right? So same thing, same process. Uh, the copyright owner have one round, then the next time, the, the person who is affected has another round, okay? So once you receive, the ISP receives the company notification, he has to tell uh, the person involved that, okay, I will restore it in 10 days, but I will only do it if I don't receive another notification from <clears throat> the copyright owner that he has filed an action in court to restrain you 
from engaging in any infringing activity relating to the material on the service provider's network. <clears throat> so what this provision is designed to do is this, all right? Once the ISP has received a notification from the copyright owner, it basically placed, uh, places an obligation on the copyright owner to launch a suit or launch an action against the person who is hosting the website or the blog, you know? And uh, because the ISP needs to know that the copyright owner is serious and is genuine in protecting the, the copyright uh, that it alleged to have been infringed uh, and, and which warrants the ISP's actions to take down uh, the material online. So if you're not serious, don't bother the ISP because once you start to bother the ISP, you better be prepared to file an action in court. This is basically what section 43H says. Okay, <clears throat> a very interesting feature, but I, I uh, but because due to the lack of uh, reported cases, uh, we have not seen to what extent this section has been uh, applied in real life, but it will be certainly, certainly very interesting to see a reported case in this. Okay, uh, okay, we have 15 more minutes. Uh, uh, Okay, questions are coming in. Okay, I'll, I'll try to finish as fast as I can uh, and reserve some time for questions. <coughs> so the next thing uh, is also a very immediate type of um, protection in so far as uh, IP enforcement is concerned. <coughs> Apologies. So uh, once you have, the, this is flowing from uh, section 43H, uh, you know, where, where if you're serious in protecting your, your IP rights, uh, generally you should consider an action in court. So once all the necessary considerations has been made, uh, you think closely, you think hard, that a court uh, action is inevitable. The first port of call is usually to apply for an ex parte injunction. Now what ex parte injunction does is it gives it an immediate stop. <coughs> to any infringing activities there may be. Uh, in getting ex parte injunctions, of course, you apply uh, the, the landmark case of American Sunderby and as, as adopted in the Malaysian case of Keith, Gerald Francis and Noel John. Uh, there must be serious issues to be tried, balance of convenience, all those tests you have to satisfy to show the court there's a, there's a genuine concern that the infringing activities goes on you suffer irreparable loss. And therefore, while waiting for the court action, <coughs> apologies, to be concluded, the defendant must be stopped from uh, any activities that may infringe my trademark. So this type of uh, injunctions are fairly common. Uh, They're fairly applied for to be taken out in a lot of uh, trademark infringement cases, especially because it deals with goods and services. Uh, but one has to be very, very uh, sure about the case uh, that, uh, that it is about to take. And a certain level of due diligence must be done because an ex parte injunction has a very far and wide ranging uh, consequences, especially in cases where the goods and services in dispute are the lifeline of the business uh, of the defendant. There are cases where courts has refused to grant ex parte injunctions uh, because uh, the livelihood and the, 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 the survival of the defendant business is depending on this kind of goods that it is sold. So in that kind of situation, it will be unfair and unjust if uh, pending the disposal of the action, the defendant is refrained and, and injuncted from continuing with his business activities. Because mind you, remember at the end of the day, if the court agrees with the plaintiff that there is an infringement of trademark, the plaintiff is entitled to damages on accounts of profits. What this means is the plaintiff is entitled to all profits and income generated from the goods or services that it alleged to have infringed upon. So for example, say that from the start of a case, 
I as a defendant, I made 500,000 from infringing on your goods. At the end of the case, I have to pay you 500,000 back. But in the meantime, at least I can survive and I can maintain the action and defend myself in the action, you know? So it is, it is a very, very, uh, though it's a very common measure, but I, I would argue that it is a very uh, uh, consequential uh, relief to ask for. And one has to be very, very sure of one's case before one applies for ex parte injunction because it has far ranging repercussions. Uh, a second type of uh, order that is commonly applied for is the Anton Pillar order. Now, uh, as the landmark case of Anton Pillar KG against manufacturing processes has said, <clears throat> Anton Pillar orders are designed to deal with situations created by infringements of patents, trademarks, and copyright, or more correctly, with acts of piracy. <clears throat> which have become a large and profitable business in recent years. They are intended to provide a quick and efficient means of recovering infringing articles and of discovering the sources from which these articles have supplied and the persons to whom they are distributed before those concerned have had time to destroy or conceal them. Their essence is surprise. So, and then pillar orders are basically orders for you. It's, it's akin to, to a trap purchase or to a raid, if, if, if I may draw the analogy, but it is done uh, with a court order. And it is done in a civil sense because raid, uh, raid actions may involve criminal elements, but and the pillar orders are purely civil and they allow you to secure uh, evidence with the element of surprise, okay? Um, so it is also not easy to get this kind of orders. You, you need to fulfill several requirements. So first, there must be an extremely strong prima facie case. Two, the damage potential or actual must be very serious for the plaintiff. And three, there must be clear evidence that the defendant have in their possession incriminating documents or things, or there's a real possibility that they may destroy such material before any application interparties can be made. Now, Anton Pillar orders in our experience it is very commonly applied for in actions of breach of confidence, especially in this digital age. Confidential information will most likely be in digital form. You don't see people carrying uh, confidential information in hard copies anymore, labeled as a top secret, confidential in a sealed envelope. Nobody does that nowadays. You may have some, but it's not as common as uh, confidential information carried in digital form in the current age. So in those kind of situations, it's very common for infringers, once they find out that an action against is taken against them, they will go to their laptop and they'll start clearing out all the incriminating evidence. So what you want to avoid is that situation. So what you do is you go and get an anthem pillar order, you go to the defendant's premises, show him the order, seize his laptop and start doing a cloning or ghosting of the laptop. Uh, no, the more, the more precise technical term is mirroring. You have to mirror the hard disk of the laptop. So we have uh, uh, experts and sometimes lawyers also have this uh, facility where uh, they would basically have uh, sufficient infrastructure to clone and to mirror the hard disk drive or, or any piece of equipment that defendant has, which would give them a digital trail of what information has been taken and what information has been distributed. Of course, there are cases where even you have gotten the anthem pillar order, the defendant has heard wind that you're coming and efforts were being taken to delete and remove the incriminating evidence in laptop. In those kind of situations, I was given to understand that uh, those information and those efforts can still be detected because after you've mirrored the hard disk and the, you know, of the laptop, all these uh, activity logs of copying and pasting, deleted, deleting and whatnot will still be on record. Okay, so that becomes an evidential exercise when you go to court and argue before the court, hey judge, you know, he knew where we were coming, he deleted everything, you know, this is the evidence. And, and uh, so 
that is the fun part uh, of, of arguing breach of confidence cases. The, the evidential angle is always very interesting. Okay. Uh, I am given the cue that I'm running out of time. Um, so I will just quickly wrap up and deal with the questions. There's quite a few and I don't think I can answer all, but I'll try the best that I can. Okay. So once uh, evidence has been provided for and, and uh, you have gone through the motion of trial, you established your entitlement to uh, damages, uh, that there is an infringement, and you are entitled to compensation. Uh, these are the type of relief that you'll be looking at. Damages on account of profit basis. This means however much money the person has made uh, on the basis of infringing your IP, he's liable to coffee back to you. Uh, that person is also liable to deliver up the infringing articles or goods to you. You're entitled to destroy them. You're entitled to keep them and whatnot. The point is to take away all the infringing materials on the defendant's hands. Of course, permanent injunction is a consequential uh, order against the defendant to not to repeat his offense again. And there are some, some orders, they do include a publication or advertisement of the court order, basically is to send a signal to the market that you know, my product has been infringed my bit by this particular defendant. And everyone, please take note. So whatever purchase that you bought from this person is basically no good, please come to me. So that is basically the rationale of publication or advertisement of these orders, uh, which serves to save up or, or try to do some damage control of uh, any harm done to the reputation or the goodwill of the business, if any. Okay. So question time. Okay. Uh, okay, so since we're running out of time, I, I thought I want to spend some time to talk about some of the cases I've done in the past. But since we are running out of time, perhaps I'll deal with the questions first. And once the questions are, are answered, I'll go to some of the cases I've done in the past. Perhaps I'll just take one. Huh? I'll answer some questions and then I'll just talk about just one of the cases I've done and I was involved in in the past. Okay, uh, question one. Uh, in the case of employer-employee relationship and the architect and the company, can you contract out of the copyright mechanism whereby the owner can retain the copyright under the employment contract services con and under the employment contract or the services contract. Let me phrase the question according to what I understand. So what I think the question is trying to ask, correct me if I'm wrong, is whether by agreement, can an author retain the copyright under the employment contract or services contract? Of course you can. It's contractual. You see, because the copyright uh, resides with the author first, and if there's an agreement in place to say, you know, you're entitled to the copyright, then for whatever work that you've done, uh, though I, I would deem these kind of clauses to be quite rare in practice because employers or, and or the buyers of your services usually want to retain the copyright as well. But of course, if by agreement, you can secure a type of consent where you can, where the author can still retain the copyright, this agreement is valid. So yes, the answer is yes, you can. All right. Second question is, can artificial intelligence methodology uh, be patented? Now, I've done a talk on AI before this. Um, of course, as a lay person, uh, AI, unfortunately, I still don't have the full graphs of AI. Uh, but if you're talking about methodology in the sense of sequencing, in the sense of organizing uh, information in a way uh, that the AI would digest uh, and whatnot. I think there's a similarly reported case on this before. I can't recall which, uh, which is where, where the, the issue before the court is the sequencing or the, of the information for the AI to digest was questioned. So remember that 
insofar as patent is concerned, it must be novel. It must uh, involve an inventive step. So if the methodology that you are talking about here simply involves sequencing of information uh, to be digested by the AI, I would argue that there is a high chance that it may not be patented because it may not be novel or it may not be uh, evolving an inventive step. Unless you're saying the sequencing is so new and so novel that nobody has thought about it before and it is not obvious to a skilled expert, then in that situation, it may be patented. But, but I think this question is very broad based and, and it, it really depends on what literature that is available out there on AI methodology. So I would answer that so long as there's sufficient novelty and inventive step to the AI methodology, it can be patented. So my answer is basically saying, uh, some you can, some you cannot, depending on, on how the, me the methodology is actually defined. Yeah. So question three, uh, confidential information. A has an employment contract with a salary of 5,000 with his employer B. A goes for interview with a new employer. C, can A disclose details of his contract, including his salary? Ha <laughs> uh, ha, current salary with B to C. So basically this one involves um, confidential discussions lah, between uh, this A and C, his potential potential new employer new not new employer huh? because uh disclose the including current salary okay so, so now i need to define huh? so a goes for an interview with new employer c so i would suppose that the context of this question is during the interview itself can you disclose details of your current contract so mind you in your contract uh, I presume in your current employment contract, there is a confidentiality clause that says you can't disclose information to anybody else uh, without the company's consent whatsoever. So if you have the kind of clause in place, uh, I would argue that if it is some, it is found out that, you know, when you go for this interview and you have disclosed information about your contract to the potential new employer, this may be seen as a breach of confidence. But if you're talking about a situation where you're only disclosing your current salary with your potential new employer for purposes of uh, you know, negotiation, that area is a bit gray because the test of confidentiality is, it must, it must be an information that is imparted to you on, uh, on the basis of uh, confidentiality. I think there are some reported cases on whether uh, salary the, the numbers of salary is deemed to be confidential. And whether in the specific situation of negotiation for new work, uh, new workplace, whether it's deemed to be uh, a breach of confidence, I would think it's very fact specific. But if you're talking about a common case where I'm just disclosing my salary so that I can get a better deal elsewhere, uh, I don't think that there is a breach of confidence because uh, there's no element of damage suffered by the company in your disclosure of your current salary to your potential new employer. You know, so the, if the element of damage is, is absent, I would think that it's a bit difficult to establish a case of breach of confidence because usually an element of damage would be required. So I would answer generally no. Uh, that this is, would not be a breach of uh, confidence and if you just disclose your salary, probably you can get away with it. Uh, but don't quote me, uh, I don't have the full facts. So uh, it always comes with a disclaimer. Next question, uh, issuance of uh, CND letter or letter of demand. <clears throat> is it a prerequisite to court action to seek remedies? No, it is not. All you need to get remedies for IP infringement is the evidence of IP infringement. No requirement of CCND letter or letter of demand, but people do it. Uh, for the purpose of establishing a position and of course to avoid the argument of saying uh, estoppel, you know, you, you have not issued any demand against me before uh, or there are some conducts in the past which may indicate some sort of agreement for the infringement to go on. So in those situations, it may be more appropriate to state a letter to state your position. But if 
let's say that you have not, you don't have any contradictory actions or conduct in condoning the infringement before, generally, I don't think it's necessary to issue a CND letter or letter of demand before you can start a court action. So the answer is no. The next question is, can someone circulate the work of a copyright owner or photo to the public rights website with a written acknowledgement together with such circulation that such work generated? Can she or he get into trouble with this? Uh, okay, this is, this is a specific provision in the Copyrights Act. And so long as you do this, it is allowed. But I would argue that it doesn't apply to a case where you actually make money, even with a written acknowledgement. You know, uh, I, I assume that if your website, if it's an education website or it's just a website uh, to disclose or, or to share information with this written acknowledgement, it'd be fine. But if you're making money out of uh, this person's work, even with a written acknowledgement, I don't, think you get, I don't think you can get away with it. You know, because remember the whole idea of copyright law is to protect a person's labor of fruit, you see. So I don't think you can get away with everything and launch if you're making money out of it. So please be careful. Okay, just one last question I will answer. I don't have time to answer everyone. Ex party injunction, economy activities get stopped by hearing of only one party. Isn't that a breach of natural justice? Um, ex party injunctions, the way it works is this. Once you get, a, once you get the ex party injunction, within a certain period of time, the other party needs to come in and and within 21 days, you need to do your inter-parties hearing already. That is in the rules of court, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so order 29. So because ex party injunction is designed as a very quick measure for a genuinely affected plaintiff, uh, but the court at the same time don't want to prejudice the other side without hearing the other side. So ex party injunctions are not designed to be permanent. It, designed, it is designed to lapse in 21 days and cannot be renewed. Within that 21 days, you must get the defendant to come, come into court and argue whether the injunction should be prolonged or not by way of an inter-parties injunction. Inter-parties means between parties. So the short answer to this, uh, it is not a breach of natural justice. Uh, it is designed uh, with the considerations of the defendant in mind where the law requires once an ex parte injunction is granted, uh, an inter party hearing must be heard and be done in 21 days, and the ex parte injunction cannot go beyond 21 days. Okay, so no, uh, I think the law is well designed at the moment. Okay, so with that, uh, that is all our questions, and uh, I thank everyone for your time and have a good weekend. Thank you.